tonight's presenter decided to take a couple of weeks off in between jobs this past July, and a fellow rover recommended that he bike the Oregon coast. Having done plenty of backpacking, but only one weekend bike tour, he figured this would be a challenge, but doable. He only had two weeks to shape the trip from an idea to hopping on a plane. He's always loved the freedom of exploring the world on two wheels, from short rides growing up in Afton to cycling all over the Twin Cities and beyond. He joined Minnesota Rovers in 2019, which ignited his love of backpacking and the weekly bike rides in 2020 helped him get more connected with rovers and maintain his sanity and um and inspired him to combine his two favorite activities through bike touring he has also been the rovers trips director for this last year so please welcome dave for his ride down 370 miles of us 101 i'll hand it over to you dave so yeah, as Barry said, uh, I switched jobs earlier this summer, and uh, when I first accepted my the offer for the new job, I knew I wanted to take some time in between jobs. So I asked some rovers, and they said, uh, "Go this place, go that place." But the one that made the most sense, I think, was the most feasible, was biking the Oregon coast. Uh, thanks to David Byrne, a fellow biker, and so I had already had a paper map of the Pacific coast from Adventure Cycling. And this is the very map that I had on my trip. Very handy, it goes uh, step by step, turn by turn, and uh, shows where the lodging is, camping. And of course, sorry, it's not a Zoom call without a cat. Um, so I wanna thank uh, also Steven Malkowski, another bike tourist for getting me uh, introduced to Adventure Cycling, helping me out with the maps. And that being said, I'll share my screen and show the slides. And here we are. So once I put it in my two weeks, I knew I had to do it quickly. Um, July 16th through 28th was when I took the trip. Here's a timeline. So July, 2021, uh, July 1st, I put in my notice and started planning. And uh, July 10th, dropped off my bike for a tune-up. July 11th, picked it up from the shop, uh, from the tune-up. Uh, Tuesday the 13th, shipped it to Oregon via UPS ground. And the 16th, flew to Portland. The 18th, picked up the bike, started riding. On the 26th, I finished biking. I was at my destination town. Uh, the next day, the 27th, took three buses to Medford, and the 28th, I flew home. So it was an exciting month. Uh, almost half was planning, but most of it was actually going on the trip. So very eventful. Here's the logistics, how I made this trip work. So on the left, you can see, of course, the bike in the box. So the picture is actually when I took at the hotel at the end, but still it, it shows you how I packed it on the way out. It's the same way, same size box. So I didn't actually have to take off the rear wheel. I took off the front wheel and dismounted the front handlebar. Of course, the front and rear racks and my helmet and just squeezed everything in uh, as well as all the tools and hardware. Uh, just taped that up and dropped it off at the UPS store and. Out it went. Uh, I called up uh, uh, was the bike shop in a story that was Bikes and Beyond and just told them, here's what I'm doing. Uh, can I just ship my bike to you? And can I pick it up for free? They said, just ship it to us. You can just pick it up for free. So that was nice. Uh, it's pretty common in the bike community. It looks like a lot of people want to help each other. So uh, second, you can see my panniers. Uh, the Tidy Cat bucket panniers also got from Stephen Malakowski, as well as the hiking boots and water bottle. So I just folded up, taped it, wrote my name and phone number on it. And this was my checked bag for the airplane. Then on the right, that's my cloth waterproof roll top pannier from North Street Bags. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, I bring it all the time on bike rides. And it converts to a backpack, so that made it very convenient for a carry-on. 
So in the two bucket panniers, I had my food, all my cooking gear. So like a little pot, um, a boiler and a cutting board, paring knife. The other one I had uh, all the tools, uh, sleeping gear. So uh, my sleeping bag, pillow, et cetera. And in my pannier, I kept all my clothes. So it worked out very well. And here is the route from Astoria all the way down to Brookings. That was 370 miles. All right, so July 16th, I flew to Portland. Uh, took a light rail to the city where I had the afternoon to myself to just hang out and do some sightseeing. And then later took the bus uh, by the old train station, which took me all the way out to Seaside. On the way out, I got a nice bird's eye view of Mount St. Helens, so I had to take a picture. So when I was in Portland, I got to go see the Portland Rose Garden. And yes, since I had to carry that check bag between the airport and going to the bus, I carried that Amazon box all the way around Portland. <laughs> when I was at the Rose Garden, I got a number of comments of people saying, oh my gosh, the Amazon delivery people, they really do deliver everywhere. I just played it off like, yep, I'm the Amazon delivery guy. <laughs> but, so it was fun to see. Of course, you can see all the, the beautiful colors there. Uh, pardon the card alarm in the background that's not part of the presentation. That was not at the Rose Garden, that's just, here. All right. Once I got to Seaside, I checked into my hostel and then got to see the glorious Pacific Coast sunset. It's just, it's amazing seeing the sun go down over the horizon once the ocean, if you ever get the chance. So my first and second nights, I was at the Seaside Hostel. I found it on Airbnb. It was the cheapest place in the area. Uh, everything in Astoria was booked that night, so I wasn't able to get my bike that night, um, but this is much cheaper and it's still on the bus route. So as you can see on the left, the hostel is really just an old house that's been converted and it's on a river near the ocean. So uh, they had some, uh, some like, kayaks and canoes there, but I just went down to the beach and hung out. On the right, you can see my bunk. So I called them up a couple weeks beforehand and I had booked a room. Uh, they didn't charge me for it though, but uh, I got there and they said, sorry, the room that we booked for you has been taken. We gave it to somebody else. And of course I was disappointed. So I said, we do have a new wing under construction. We're converting a room to these single cell lofts. And if you want, you can take the one that's finished for free. I said, sure. You know, I, I plan on camping every night anyway. I'm low key, I'll take it. So this is it, my little capsule bunk. So the next morning I took the bus up to Astoria and anyone who's been there would know it by the large bridge. It's uh, extremely tall and extremely long, uh, spans the mouth of the Columbia River and it's tall enough for large shipping vessels to move under it. And on the right, this is a city park kitty corner from uh, Bikes and Beyond, where I picked up my bike and assembled it there. So I just pulled it out of the box, uh, attached my panniers and threw the cardboard boxes away and off I went. So here it is, my rig, of course, on the left, it's the orange Marin Fairfax. Some of you have seen it if you've gone on rover rides with me. And of course the bucket panniers with the, the hiking boots attached to the top of it. The hiking boots were a little bit cumbersome because they tend to slide around a little bit, but I just wanted to have some kind of closed toed shoes besides my sandals because you never know if it rains or if some reason I need to get up a steep slope of mud, you never know. I just thought I'm going 370 miles. I want to make sure I've got something sturdy. And on the back, on the rear cargo rack, I've got my tent strapped with a bungee cord and a couple socks there just to air out during the day. And on the back side of it, you can see the orange cloth pannier. So everything fit nicely. Uh, some people ask me why I went with an odd number of panniers. Usually people have either two or four. 
for me, uh, this is really all I had. So that's one reason. Other reason is it fit everything that I needed to bring with me on the trip. So it worked. And I'm used to having one pannier on the backside. So I'm used to having the little bit of a weight differential, but um, I'm so used to it. It didn't bother me at all. And of course, on the right side, that's your host. And I wore that bright orange or that bright yellow shirt, uh, at least first several days to just you know, make sure I'm visible. Later, I changed to something long sleeve because there was so much sun. But of course, we've got that orange bandana on the back, so it'll help with sun protection. And this is the first view outside Astoria. Uh, on most of the route, the, the route is a shoulder of Highway 101, and it's three to four feet wide, so very wide, very safe for biking. And uh, apparently the route going south is usually wider because so many more people bike this route going south than north because of the wind direction. Winds blow to the south or southeast. Back in Seaside, back where it started. I just love that sign. I love the colors. And of course, the beautiful Seaside sunset again. A lot of folks had bonfires. Not really supposed to, but you know, they're still fun to have. There's a close up. Next day, July 18th, I went from Seaside to Barview Jetty County Park, passing through Cannon Beach down the way, known for its uh, large haystacks. So these are the giant haystacks, which are rock formations out on the coast. And just for scale, you can see there's the little itty bitty ant people on the shore and the little house down at the bottom of the picture, just to give you a sense for how tall these things really are. Uh, by the way, Lewis and Clark went to Cannon Beach, so several parts on my route, uh, Lewis and Clark had also recorded in the journal. Yeah, going south, just a beautiful view. Of course, uh, nice highway, plenty of shoulder. You can see more of the ocean back in the foreground. And this Cannon Beach from further up on a bluff. The entire Oregon Coast bike route is signed. So there are uh, vertical signs like this all the way down. There are also painted marks on the shoulder marking the route. So that always helped in case I doubted the map. July 19th, Barview Jetty County Park to Whalen Island County Park going through Tillamook, 31 miles. And this is a scene you won't see in Minnesota. That is a mountain of clams, clam shells. Uh, there's a lot of fish canning, fish processing, um, both uh, the swimming fish and shellfish all down the coast. So smelled a lot of that going down, but um, wasn't all the time, thankfully. And of course, the famous Tillamook Creamery. I had to go in. So when you go in, it's extremely spacious. They make it uh, very accessible for visitors. And if you go up through the front entryway up to the second floor, there's a guided tour uh, or self-guided tour. So you walk through some different stations. You can look down from the second floor on their cheese packaging operations there. So here it looks like they're weighing, slicing and packaging cheese. And of course I had lunch there. Just a nice basic grilled cheese and tomato soup. Going out of Tillamook, the route took me away from the coast and into some forest. And it uh, looks like a lot of routes here in Minnesota, uh, heavy deciduous and uh, coniferous forest on a dirt road. So nice and idyllic. And home sweet home. So each night, uh, I, I was at a park and they had hiker biker sites. So it's a, a site designated for people that arrive by either uh, the bicycle or by foot. So uh, it's nice. Those are always designated there. And thankfully it didn't get any rain, but regardless had the rain fly anyway, you can see my layout. So same gear, bring backpacking. There's the tent, a sleeping pad inside there, some clothes. My panniers, of course, and on the, 
bigger table, you can see the plastic odor-proof bag. That's the same one I bring backpacking in my Ursac uh, bear-proof container. July 20th, Wayland Island County Park to Devil's Lake Rec Area, Lincoln City. 59 miles, that was a long day, but I uh, had a nice meal at a restaurant to make up for it. Uh, throughout the Oregon coast, when you go into a town that's near the ocean, you see these signs either entering or leaving tsunami tide zones. Uh, it's a phenomenon, of course, we don't have here in Minnesota, but uh, if there's uh, basically an earthquake underwater, it causes a very large tidal wave, also known as a tsunami. And these are just designated markers knowing uh, when you're safe in case of evacuation. Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen when I was out there. I saw many houses and yards decorated with just uh, random decor, like these buoys that just came up on shore. So it's always kind of fun to see that. And a random sunken ship in a river, because, you know, why not? These were the most dangerous places that I visited on the trip where uh, these uh, parts of the highway where it became narrow or maybe it's just like a side highway off 101. It's more narrow when it goes around a curve and uh, here there's no traffic, but sometimes there are trucks, uh, especially logging trucks, and you don't really have a shoulder because when it's going through a curve, sometimes it's just, it's more narrow if it's on a bridge like this. So uh, sometimes white knuckle biking, white, white knuckle biking, but here this is just a beautiful scene in the forest. They get so much rain out there that everything is, looks like it's dripping with moss. Out in Oregon, they have what are called thimble berries, and I believe these also grew up in northern Minnesota. Uh, I wasn't sure if these are edible, so I actually took a pass on these, but they look pretty anyway. And at last, Devil's Lake Rec Area, Lincoln City. This is the only state recreation or park site in Oregon that is actually within city limits. So it's just kind of funny seeing what looks like a state park, the way it's laid out with like the woods and the little roads going through it and campsites, but then you've got city blocks right next to you. So I thought this is a funny picture just showing you know, on the other side of the fence, there's a street, there's a house, another house and RV behind. And um, one thing I really liked about the state park system though, is uh, with these hiker biker sites, you don't have a designated slot or a campsite. It's just an area. And as long as you can physically fit your tent, then you have a spot. So they made it really easy and I didn't have to make reservations every night. And as you can see, there are some posts there to hitch up your bike, to keep it safe. And on the right behind the picnic table, there are lockers. So uh, I could keep some things out of my tent, but uh, knowing it's safe, I brought a padlock just in case I need it. So it came in handy. July 21st, Devil's Lake Rec Area, Lincoln City to Beachside State Recreation Site, 44 miles. First, they passed through a small town called Depot Bay, and it's apparently the world's smallest harbor. And there she is. It's a harbor, and it's small. Coming out of Depot Bay, uh, I took a side road, and this is just beautiful. I mean, it, it's a country road. It's got one lane in one direction, and uh, basically a third of that road is the bike lane going through a forest like this. So it's, it's nice. Um, the adventure cycling bike route doesn't always follow 101. Sometimes it takes you on side routes like this. It's a little more quiet and relaxing. Just stunning scenery like this all over the place. Uh, the Oregon coast is just up and down with bluffs all over the place. And this is uh, several hundred feet up and you can see uh, you know, several miles. You can see uh, those houses look like the person on the edge of a cliff. So <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's beautiful. Just the, the ocean, the cliffs, the forest right there. On to Newport, which is apparently the friendliest. You see a lot of these little nice tourist towns along the way. A lot of towns will look like Grand Marais. So imagine like Grand Marais going all the way down the coast. That's more or less what it looks like. 
So this is how I cooked several of my meals. I would get as dry ingredients. This here is rice and um, green lentils. I brought some coconut powder and made like a makeshift curry. So I brought my own uh, curry powder that I ground at home and mixed in some spinach. And this is the nice thing about bike touring where um, unlike backpacking, where you need to carry all your food for several days with bike touring, you're passing through a town um, every day or two, depending here on this Oregon coast bike route, I was passing through several towns a day. So resupplying was a cinch and I could get some fresh fruit or veggies every day if I wanted to. So that made it easy to eat healthy on the go. So a uh, nice filling gourmet meal for lunch. I passed through a city park and these I believe are whale bones. I thought that was cool. There's a, this bay by the river there called Yakina Bay. And I thought this was interesting. What's the bird in the middle? It's the common loon. I don't know they lived there. Um, apparently loons migrate throughout the US, but they only breed in the very Northern part of Northern states. So uh, they don't breed down in Oregon apparently, but um, uh, at least they're, they're visible. Uh, they do migrate sometimes down to Oregon. This is the bridge coming out of Newport. This beautiful old, uh, nearly 100 year old Art Deco style bridge uh, spans the river. Uh, many bridges along the Oregon coast were built in the same era. So they have the same architectural style. You can see the, the pillars and, uh, and the, the steel truss arch that's very common. So before I got on the bridge, I need to make a decision either to press the button to illuminate the yellow flashing light to warn I'll be biking in the lane, or I would need to hoof it on the sidewalk. Uh, obviously the bridges were built uh, long before people started bike touring. Uh, the Oregon Coast bike route didn't form until I think the eighties or nineties. So they had to retrofit the bridges for bike touring. I chose to just hoof it on the sidewalk. I thought that was a lot safer. And I figure I'm on vacation. I'm not in a hurry. I can just take my time and get a better view of uh, the ocean on the other side. So that's what I did. Again, hiker biker campsites, very conveniently labeled. And a home sweet home again. The bathroom was right there, very convenient and just Behind where I took this picture was the ocean, so I could hear the waves all night. Dinner is uh, just like with uh, car camping. So uh, semi-perishable food. Of course, I got some cheese at uh, Tillamook. So I had this to enjoy on the way down. Uh, tortilla, pepperoni, cheese, spinach, and a packet of mayo. What more can you ask for? Another beautiful sunset. I think it's the same couple from the first picture in, in Seaside. All right, July 22nd, Beachside State Recreation Site to Umqua Lighthouse State Park. This uh, near in the morning here, I passed through one of several tunnels, uh, another long day, 59 miles. So I will show you uh, what it's like to go through a tunnel. Here's a picture of it off in the distance, going through that bluff. And here's a video. So I first press the button and this is from my phone, how I kept it on my holder on my bike. So you get it from that perspective. As you can see, there's hardly any shoulder.
All right, this gives you a taste of what that's like going through a tunnel. I did several of those going down the coast. So they do have the, bl the blinking light, which warns the trucks and the vehicles uh, coming behind you, but it's not going to physically stop a car from hitting you. So you press the button, bike as fast as you can and pray. <laughs> The town of Yahat, another nice little town. Again, you can see the, the route is marked. Hiker biker campsite again. It's nice of them to put the sign pointing my tent. Very convenient. So on some of these campgrounds, we had shared water. You can see the little spigot behind my tent. So Sometimes folks would go through the campsite to grab water, but no big deal. We're all one big happy biker family. That night, as part of my dinner, just made whatever I had, another tortilla, threw on some peanut butter, leftover plain oats that I didn't know how else to use, and a banana. Away we go. July 23rd, Uncle Lighthouse State Park to Bullard's Beach State Park, passing through Coos Bay one of the bigger towns in Southern Oregon, 46 miles that day. I saw this and thought it was kind of creepy, but also a reminder, leave no trace, which I did not. Welcome to Oregon's Bay Area. Apparently they have a Bay Area too. Bullard's Beach State Park to Humbug Mountain State Park, 35 miles. This is the... Coquille River Lighthouse, built in the 1800s, um, no longer in service. I think there are eight lighthouses from uh, the, those navigation days that are still uh, upstanding in Oregon. Uh, none of them are in use for navigation, but they are still uh, used just for museums. They are preserved. I wasn't able to go into this one. It was closed that day, but at least I could see it. Some more random yard work. Of course, they've got someone on a bicycle. Some more rock formations. Not quite the haystacks I saw in the northern part, but still amazing nonetheless, especially seeing it just kind of fade out into the fog. Welcome to World Famous Lang Lewis. I've never heard of it. Port Orford. I just love these little small town signs, so that's why I keep showing them. This is Humbug Mountain State Park with uh, the bluff, which is Humbug Mountain in the background. So one thing that's nice about this Hiker Baker area is it was on a steep slope. And so they had to kind of uh, dig like steps into the hill for the campground. And so each campsite had its own little secluded area. So made it for a little bit more privacy. And all around the tent, all around the campsite there, were uh, blueberry bushes, sorry, not blueberries, blackberry bushes. This was dinner, another meal I cooked. So uh, this is uh, like nor uh, pasta. You can, it's like those cheap instant dinners you get at the grocery store. Threw some lentils and some pepperoni. July 25th, Humbug Mountain State Park to Turtle Rock RV Park, 24 miles. A little bit easier day. Again, these are those blackberries I mentioned that were surrounding my campsite there at Humbug Mountain. And so in the morning, I indulged myself. I made breakfast, threw them in a little roll up. On the way down, uh, that next day, I had to repair some flats and I repaired them right here. So definitely not a bad place to repair one. Got the nice, beautiful scenery in the background. This is a rest area that had a public beach. And just off the right side of the picture was one of those little shower hose down stations. So there's a puddle there. I could conveniently uh, dunk my inflated tube inside and see where the bubbles are coming out. So that worked very nice to help me identify where the holes were and put the patches on. Another Art Deco style bridge. Again, the, those arches, just a very common style I had back then. Very beautiful. 
July 26th, Turtle Rock RV Park to Brookings, 27 miles to finish off the bike trip. And yes, they had goats, because why not? And this is why it's called Turtle Rock. This is just a little rock formation out on the coast right outside the park. Shortly before I got to Brookings, there was this Thomas Creek High Bridge, the highest bridge in Oregon at 345 feet. And unfortunately, all I could see from there was gray, solid gray because the fog came in because it's on the ocean. So I saw amazing pictures of this online when I was planning my trip. I thought, great, I'm going to pass over that very bridge and see it. Well, I saw the bridge, but I couldn't see any scenery, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I saw several other bridges, so I still got my fill. And at last, Brookings. I just had to laugh when I saw this at the end of my trip. My legs were just dying as I really pushed myself, getting uh, 370 miles in uh, about eight days. Easy street. This here is Chetco Point in the town of Brookings. So. Uh, it was just fun just to walk around there, see the uh, different rock formations. And uh, the, the ocean actually looks like a different color um, in some different parts of the coast. Some is a little more green, some is more blue. But it was fun thing, seeing that. This is the escape hatch. This is a bike shop down in Brookings. Uh, the only bike shop I could find there. So I asked the owner if I could just grab a bike box that he was going to toss. So... He let me have one. I dragged it back to my hotel and packed up my bike. So all the tools I had in my pannier, I used to take apart my bike in my hotel room, packed it back up just like I did on the way out. And I bought a prepaid UPS ground shipping label. Um, I did that before my trip and I had a, I carried it with me all the way down. So I wrapped my little roll of shipping tape. And once this is all in, taped everything up and I taped the shipping label to the outside and went to a grocery store and grabbed this uh, peanut box to put in uh, my panniers, tent and hiking boots. I cut another part of a box out to put on top, wrote my name and phone number on it and taped it up really good with the uh, shipping tape. And uh, before I left, I dropped off my bike when I checked out and said to the hostess, make sure the only person that takes this bike is UPS on their shirt and they're wearing brown shorts. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want anyone taking my bike, sending it to via UPS. And this is me after uh, over a week of biking. You can see the nice uh, neck warmer going on. So I took three buses from Brookings to Medford. Uh, so the bus system I took from Portland to Seaside and then Astoria, and it's called the point system. It's part of the Oregon public transit. Uh, it's like a coach bus system that goes across the entire state, goes all the way down the coast. I took that to go from Brookings to Cave Junction. Uh, when I was going through California, uh, it stopped in the town of Crescent City and along that route, it actually goes into the redwood forest and there are mountains and uh, hills and rivers and ravines. It's just gorgeous. And that's extremely close to the film site for return of the Jedi. And my bus driver said that several people who were working to film that movie were staying in Brookings at the time they were filming it. So that's kind of cool. Took a transfer at cave junction it was a county transit bus, which looks just like a regular Metro Transit bus that we have here, except they have those going across counties. Uh, they were very good public transit out there, so that was extremely helpful. Took that to Grants Pass. Had another transfer to Medford. So uh, on the 28th, flew from Medford to MSP back home by way of Seattle. July 29th. I rested, I got a massage that day, my body thanked me. And uh, several months earlier, I had committed to a uh, beginner backpack two-nighter with rovers. So July 30th through August 1st, I was doing that. And August 2nd was the first day at my new job. So 
a very busy month, but very exciting. And uh, yeah, after that, I just cooled it with the exercise for a while. <laughs> and my message to you all is seize the day. All right. Any questions, comments? So do you still have that same job? Uh, the job I just started? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully it worked out. I'm still there. There's a, there's a few questions in the chat if you can, if you can see them. Yeah, I see them. All right. Let me go through. Um, Dave, did you plan ahead of time where you're going to stay each night? I did for the first uh, few nights. Um, I was getting kind of worried about finding a place because uh, I knew it was going during peak season. And so uh, I booked the hostel, the two nights there, um, and then the two nights of the county parks. And then after that, um, I just I ran out of time to finish planning and booking. And I just thought to, you know, I don't know how my body's going to feel every day. So I thought it'd be better off for me just to kind of gauge where I'm at. And I saw there's so many parks along the way that I decided not to worry with it. So um, honestly, I could have gone uh, pretty much the entire trip without booking lodging. It's just that where I wanted to actually stay in a hotel, like in Brookings and like, Astoria or in Seaside, it would be smartest to book a hotel there. But as far as camping, there's so many places uh, you wouldn't really need to, to book nights there. Uh, someone asked the tent, uh, what the tent is what and how long to erect like it. Um, so it's a big Agnes tiger wall UL three. So ultralight, sorry, UL two. So a two person ultralight tent, uh, same one I bring backpacking. Um, it's, it's not very big, like yay big. Um, it, it takes like five minutes, maybe 10 minutes to set up. So I recommend it. Uh, was the current, was the amount of elevation gain over the course of the trip? Um, actually I didn't crunch the numbers, but the, uh, Pacific coast bike map does have elevation charts. It was never enough for me to, uh, really experience elevation sickness. Uh, it's more like going up and down the bluffs here in Minnesota. Uh, that's what they have out there and you're, you're right by the ocean. So you're close to sea level. So uh, oxygen level is not a concern. Someone asked, I think it's my dad asking, so Dave, do you ever rest? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other cyclists did you meet? Uh, almost every night I met other cyclists or hikers. Um, there were, uh, yeah, here's my cat. Um, this is my dad and his wife's former cat. That's why they're laughing right now. She says, hi. Uh, can you hear us, Steve? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll mute. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so as far as other cyclists I met, uh, at you know, most of the campsites on the way down, people were doing the same thing. They were biking the coast. Uh, some were biking all the way from uh, Canada to Mexico the whole coast. Uh, some are just biking throughout the Western States for several months. Uh, most people I met were taking either intentionally exterior and some periods of time off of work, um, like months, or they simply did not have a permanent place of employment or a permanent, uh, uh home, uh, a roof over the head. So they would just live in one part of the state for a while or a few months and another part of the state and then live with a relative for another few months. And, Kind of move around so it's interesting hearing people living just different life experiences and what that's like and uh it i got the impression it's a lot easier to uh, be homeless and move around in oregon because their climate is so much milder than minnesota's because they're on the coast um they also have very good public transit systems so it's very easy for someone uh who's not on a, a bicycle or walking to get around uh, but i met yeah, a number of other people who were you know, just taking time off like myself. They had full-time jobs, full-time housing, and um, we were just doing the same thing. Um, I did meet one young woman who was hiking the Oregon coast. And uh, the last few, day, few days and nights, we ended up 
kind of passing each other and we ended up camping at the same state park. So it was kind of, it's kind of fun too. And I told her, yeah, I'm mostly a backpacker, but just trying something new this time. How much does it cost to ship a bike? Um, if you're smart and go with a company like ship bikes, it's a lot less expensive. I think they have a flat rate of like a hundred some. I looked at that and then looked at UPS and I think it got confused with their uh, pricing system. So I ended up uh, paying way more because when I actually shipped it, it was um, much more expensive. Um, so for me, I did it the hard way. Uh, shipping out was 271. Shipping it back home was 304, which is a very significant uh, chunk of my trip cost. So learn from my mistake. Uh, do it a different way, like ship bikes or uh, uh, someone else. All right. Any other questions or comments? What is your tent way? <laughs> my tent. Um, offhand, I want to say it's like two or two and a half pounds. Uh, it's oh. like Big Agnes Tiger Wall UL2. So uh, I think it's the 2021 model. So whatever that says online, that's the exact number. But yes, yeah, it's very light. I bring it backpacking. Oh, that's a light. It doesn't have a rain fly then too. It looked like it did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. yeah. So I got the tarp for the bottom and I specifically bought this model because uh, I was looking for a tent I could set up in the rain and I watched a YouTube video first to prove it's actually doable. And you can, if you set up the, the tarp first and then the, um, like the support, the, aluminum rods, then put in the rain fly over that and they snap to the tarp. Then you can put in your backpack and pull out the bathtub and mesh part of the tent and finish setting that up inside underneath the rain fly. And it keeps everything dry. So you don't get any rain inside your tent. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very handy. I haven't had to set up in the rain yet, uh, but if you need to, it's very, do very doable. Hmm. All right, some more questions in the chat. Uh, could I have checked the bike when I flew out? I looked on Delta's website because that's who I was flying with because I get uh, miles through them. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. I think that was an option, but I think based on some of the numbers I saw, it was more expensive than what I thought the price was going to be <laughs> shipping it. Um, I looked into going Amtrak because you can check a bike there. It's very easy. Uh, but I simply didn't have time to take the Amtrak all the way out and back. Uh, I did that eight years ago. The first time I went to Oregon, that's like 36 hours total, but you know, going through the night, I just didn't have time on this trip though. Uh, did I have the option of taking my back in the plane? Someone asked that. Um, all right. Do you have another bike trip planned upcoming? Like, did this like spur you wanting to do more of these trips? Um, nothing planned, but I found I, I really did enjoy this. Um, if I do another bike trip, I would allow uh, fewer miles per day. So either more days or just fewer miles total. And I like to go on a route that's not as heavily trafficked because one thing I really didn't like about, uh, bike touring versus backpacking is just a lot of the car exhaust and like worrying about you know, large trucks going past me. So um, that's the one downside to bike touring. But yeah, I'd be definitely open to bike touring again. I just have no definite trip planned yet. Yeah, yeah the tunnel riding looked harrowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're just like going on blind faith that, you know, someone's going to see you and you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little blinky light's not going to save you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yellow, sh yellow shirt is, is not arm armor. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so just a quick one, quick one, Dave. Mm -hmm. That's your dad. <laughs> so proud of you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Nice presentation. Yeah. A lot of planning, a lot of thinking on your feet. Yep. Yep. It's an adventure. Yeah. I love this, doing this kind of stuff. So this is my second solo trip. Uh, the first solo trip I did was hiking the Arizona trail for nine days near Phoenix in March, 2020, right as the pandemic was starting. 
And uh, doing this, these two solo trips, I find I really enjoy that. Uh, it's, it's exciting. It's an adventure. It's, I feel like it's very empowering. I was being able to, you know, figure things out and really go wherever I want, whenever I want. So I, I recommend it to people. If you, you know, feel confident that you can do something like this, or even start with small trips, uh, it can be a good way to just kind of, you know, get to know even yourself a little bit better and see things in a new way, uh, especially if you're going without a car, either by foot or by bike. Uh, it feels, yeah, it's exciting. It's empowering. So I recommend that to people as a good uh, retreat. It's a wonderful way to see God's creation. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. See you, see you at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. you yep. Love you too. Uh, were those buses very expensive? What did the bus rides cost across there? Uh... Yeah, so going from Portland to anywhere on the coast was 20 bucks. And because uh, I had to divvy it up. Uh, so going from Seaside to Astoria was only four bucks. And then from Brookings to really the end of the line, that was 20 bucks. And then uh, they got me a transfer, which I could use for the other transit systems to like Cape Junction and then to Medford. Um, yeah, so it's like from like the Willamette Valley to the coast or back is like 20 bucks. So good deal. Wow, yeah, they're yeah. basically inexpensive. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, another thing. So on the Point website, uh, for one, you need to buy your tickets through either Amtrak or Greyhound for some reason. Um, but on their website, they say you're not allowed to bring a bike on the bus. Of course, when I got to Portland, they have like the big like cargo hatch door open and I saw bikes underneath. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. So it's good to know, like the rules, sometimes they're one thing, but what people actually do is something else. And I found that a lot on Oregon is people seem very lax about rules, kind of like everyone just, their their tone is so low key. Like, I feel, yeah, that's like one of, the, one of the biggest cultural differences I saw between Minnesota here and out there, they're just like, here, we're like, everything needs to be done, like on time and, you know, fit in their neat little box and out there, they're like, yeah, who cares? <laughs> no one knows we're out here. We're on the West coast. That's kind of, you know, the attitude. Uh, someone asked what safety tips, um, as with biking on any roads, anywhere, uh, visibility is key. So, uh, like the bright yellow, um, I had a blinky flashing light on my bike bag on the rear. Uh, I'll do that when it was uh, anywhere near dawn or dusk uh, or going through a tunnel and uh, I had a headlight as well. Helmet always. Um, that's the main thing. Just, uh, I never ever wear earbuds if I'm like, anywhere remotely dangerous, um, like on any kind of bike path. Uh, even if it's on the countryside, I don't have earbuds on. So I always can hear anything coming up uh, behind me, in front of me. Um, yeah, that's really it. Just be aware of surroundings and be visible. Do you so, have a rear view mirror? I don't. Uh, no, that's I always I'm... like to see who's coming up behind me. So I like to have a rear view mirror. When I'm yeah. Biking. A lot of the hardcore bike tourists have rear view mirrors. Uh, yeah, so that'd be really helpful for doing a lot of road road biking. Someone asked, what planning resources did you use? So I used a couple different maps. There is one, uh, it's a little PDF map I got from the Oregon DOT website. Uh, it's specifically showing the Oregon bike coast route and like the wind directions, a uh, place to stay in each town, mileages, um, I also use this paper map from Adventure Cycling, uh, as well as uh, uh, the usual uh, Google web search and Airbnb looking for uh, places to stay on the bookends of my trip. And uh, yeah, beyond that, I mean, you just kind of learn as you go. There are towns everywhere. So it's like when I got low on food, I would just stroll into the next town and resupply. Um, one thing I did want to sing the praises of the Oregon State Park system. So uh, again, hiker biker campsites make it really easy. Uh, you don't have to schedule, like get a reservation beforehand. They're only eight bucks a night. You can pay cash and 
uh, they come with a shower. Almost every state park I went to had a shower. So, I mean, that's really everything you need right there. And they're not very big. Like our state parks are a lot bigger. Uh, they had much smaller parks, but there are a lot more of them going down the coast. So it made it very easy. And there was oh. a bear locker, right? At each site, there was a bear locker. They actually don't have bear out there. Um, I did bring my ursac just in case. Uh, I did put my food in there every night. Uh, I never, yeah, thankfully, no, no bears out there. But I was overprepared just in case. Uh, they did have some regular lockers just to put uh, anything in. Like uh, some nights I'd put like a pannier in there if I had a locker there, put my padlock on it. But yeah, thankfully no bear. All they have was like squirrels, uh, little rodents like that. So no big threats. Nice. Yeah. So are the hiker biker uh, campsites the only thing that's offered or are there some other bigger ones that you just didn't go to? There are a number of campgrounds out there. So the state parks, of course, have uh, regular car campgrounds. Uh, they also have RV campsites, and there are RVs everywhere. This is peak season in uh, uh, mid-late July. So all the RV campsites were taken every state park every night. Uh, there were some other uh, campgrounds in the areas. Like uh, sometimes there would be like a private campground here and there. Um, there was, those are few and far between, sometimes a county park, but um, once I got a hang of the state park system, I just stuck with that. Oh, they, um, sorry. They, uh, oh, go a, a, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, so, Rob, back to your question. Yeah. So, the Turtle Rock RV park, that was the private campground I stayed at uh, my last night camping out there. And they had a Mexican restaurant there, which is really convenient. It's like, stones throw from my tent <laughs> by the way great presentation it always sucks you're making these you're making good jokes and comments and Lori and i are laughing out loud here and i'm like you you can't hear any of it i threw up the clap sign sometimes you can't hear that but it was good you know like they have goats because why yeah. not <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> we got we got a kick out of many of your comments so i just wanted you to know oh good good thanks yeah that's what i was going for yeah, it's, you know, when you travel in small towns or especially anywhere by foot where, you know, you're off the beaten path, you just see the most random stuff like that. You know, it's, I think it's just a mon pa run RV parks. They just kind of do whatever they want, you know. Any other questions? Before we, uh, yeah, just one more. I did that on that those biking parks. Did they have somewhere like you could charge your uh, your devices and stuff like that, or like your bike, you know, uh, headlights and stuff? Yeah, uh, some of them did. Those are pretty hard to find. So I have a power bank. It's a ten thousand milliamp hour unit. Uh, same one I bring backpacking. Uh, I get several charges out of my uh, phone and headlamp out of that. So I used that and um, like halfway through the trip, I had to charge it and there wasn't a, like a designated charging place where I was at. Oh, wait, no, there was. Um, but the, the Alice they had in the lockers there had a different USB style plugin than what I brought with me. So <laughs> I had to go find something else. Um, as I brought my, uh, actual power outlet to USB-C converter. That's all I had. Um, so I had to go hunt around for an actual uh, power outlet at the state park. So it was like a little amphitheater and uh, they would place, they got like lights for shows or plays, whatever. And I had to like sneak in and like plug in with a little outdoor outlet, like my little uh, charger and just make, sh make sure that it was out of sight and no one would steal it. So. <laughs> I did it. Uh, stole some electricity, but yeah, um, sometimes you just have to do that when you don't really have anything. Just find whatever works and hope no one steals it when uh, maybe you have it out of out of your sight. Yeah, I, I doubt that bothered any. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was weird. I was in a cub parking lot the other day, and somebody was. Uh, uh, they weren't bike touring, but they're charging their stuff in the parking lot. That some of those street lamps have plugs in them. AC plugs in them. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation. That was really. 
Awesome. Makes me want to do one of those trips. <laughs> Another pannier trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Any last questions? Wow, silence. Okay, great job, Dave. That was uh, really interesting. What a trip. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm planning yeah. it at short notice. Yeah. <laughs> Just part of the adventure. <laughs>